episode of Paradise ASMR. On today's episode, we're going to continue with chapter 15 of James and the Giant Peach. So if you like what you're hearing and seeing, be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you can get some more of this feel-good, real-good stuff. So let's get to it. Outside in the garden, at that very moment, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker had just taken their places at the front gate, each with a bunch of tickets in their hand. And the first stream of early morning sightseers was visible in the distance climbing up the hill to view the beach. We shall make a fortune today, Aunt Spiker was saying. Just look at all those people. I wonder what became of that horrid little boy of ours last night, Aunt Sponge said. He never did come back in, did he? He probably fell down in the dark and broke his leg. Aunt Spiker said. Or in his neck, maybe. Aunt Sponge said hopefully. Just wait till I get my hands on him, Aunt Spiker said, waving her cane. He'll never want to stay out all night again by the time I've finished with him. Good gracious me, what's that awful noise? Both women swung round to look. The noise, of course, had been caused by the giant peach crashing through the fence that surrounded it, and now, gathering speed every second, it came rolling across the garden toward the place where Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were standing. They gaped. They screamed. They started to run. They panicked. They both got in each other's way. They began pushing and jostling, and each one of them was thinking only about saving herself. Aunt Sponge, the fat one, tripped over a box that she'd brought along to keep the money in, and fell flat on her face. Aunt Spiker immediately tripped over Aunt Sponge and came down on top of her. They both lay on the ground, fighting and clawing and yelling struggling frantically to get up again. But before they could do this, the mighty peach was upon them. There was a crunch, and then there was a silence. The peach rolled on, and behind it, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker lay ironed out upon the grass, as flat and thin and lifeless as a couple of paper dolls cut out of a picture book. Chapter 16 And now the peach had broken out of the garden and was over the edge of the hill, rolling and bouncing down the steep slope at a terrific pace. Faster and faster and faster it went, and the crowds of people who were climbing up the hill suddenly caught sight of this terrible monster plunging down upon them and they screamed and scattered to right and left as it went hurtling by. At the bottom of the hill, it charged across the road, knocking over a telegraph pole and flattening two parked cars as it went by. Then it rushed madly across about twenty fields, breaking down all the fences and hedges in its path. It went right through the middle of a herd of fine Jersey cows, and then through a flock of sheep, and then through a paddock full of horses, and then through a yard full of pigs, and soon the whole countryside was a seething mass of panic-stricken animals stampeding in all directions. The peach was still going at a tremendous speed with no sign of slowing down, and about a mile farther on it came to a village down the main street of the village it rolled, with people leaping frantically out of its path, right and left, and at the end of 
the street. It went crashing right through the wall of an enormous building and out the other side, leaving two gaping round holes in the brickwork. This building happened to be a famous factory where they made chocolate, and almost at once a great river of warm, melted chocolate came pouring out of the holes in the factory wall. A minute later, this brown sticky mess was blowing through every street in the village, oozing under the doors of houses and into people's shops and gardens. Children were wading in up to their knees, and some were even trying to swim in it, and all of them were sucking it into their mouths in great greedy gulps and shrieking with joy. But the peach rushed on across the countryside, on and on and on, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Cowsheds, stables, pigsties, barns, bungalows, hay ricks, anything that got in its way went toppling over like a ninepin. An old man sitting quietly beside a stream had his fishing rod whisked out of his hands as it went dashing by, and a woman called Daisy, and Twistle, was standing so close to it as it passed that she had the skin taken off the tip of her long nose. Would it ever stop? Why should it? A round object will always keep on rolling as long as it is on the downhill slope, and in this case, the land sloped downhill all the way until it reached the ocean. The same ocean that James had begged his aunts to be allowed to visit the day before. Well, perhaps he was going to visit it now. The peach was rushing closer and closer to it every second, and closer also to the towering white cliffs that came first. These cliffs are the most famous in the whole England, and they are hundreds of feet high. Below them, the sea is deep and cold and hungry. Many ships have been swallowed up and lost forever on this part of the coast, and all the men who are in them as well. The beach was now only a hundred yards away from the cliff, now fifty, now twenty, now ten. Now five, and when it reached the edge of the cliff, it seemed to leap up into the sky and hang there suspended for a few seconds, still turning over and over in the air. Then it began to fall, down, 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 smack. It hit the water with a colossal splash and sank like a stone. But a few seconds later, up it came again, and this time, up it stayed, floating serenely upon the surface of the water. Chapter 17 At this moment, inside the beach, itself was one of indescribable chaos. James Henry Trotter was lying bruised and battered on the floor of the room amongst a tangled mass of centipede and earthworm and spider and ladybird and glowworm and old green grasshopper. In the whole history of the world, no travelers had ever had a more terrible journey than these unfortunate creatures. It had started out well, with much laughing and shouting, and for the first few seconds, as the peach had begun to roll slowly forward, nobody had minded being tumbled about a little bit, and when it went bump, and the centipede had shouted, That was on Sponge, and then bump, again, and that was on Spiker. There had been a tremendous burst of cheering all around, but as soon as the peach rolled out of the garden and began to go down the steep hill, rushing and plunging and bounding madly downward, 
then the whole thing became a nightmare. James found himself being flung up against the ceiling, then back onto the floor, then sideways against the wall, then up onto the ceiling again, and up and down, then back and forth, then round and round, and at the same time, all the other creatures were flying through the air in every direction, and so were the chairs and the sofa, not to mention the forty-two boots belonging to the centipede. Everything and all of them were beating ra rattled around like peas and then it sighed an enormous rattle that was being rattled by a mad giant who refused to stop. To make it worse, something went wrong with the glowworm's lighting system, and the room was in pitchy darkness. There were screams and yells and curses and cries of pain and everything kept going round and round. And once James made a frantic grab at some thick bars sticking out on the wall, only to find out that they were a couple of the centipede's legs. Let go, you idiot, shouted the centipede, kicking himself free, and James was promptly flung across the room into the old green grasshopper's horny lap. Twice he got tangled up in Miss Spider's legs, a horrid business, and towards the end, the poor earthworm was cracking himself like a whip every time he flew through the air from one side of the room to the other, coiled himself around James's body in a panic and refused to unwind. Oh, it was a frantic and terrible trip, but it was all over now, and the room was suddenly very still and quiet. Everybody was beginning slowly and painfully to disentangle himself from everybody else. Let's have some light, shouted the centipede. Yes, they cried. Light. Give us some light. I'm trying, answered the poor glowworm. I'm doing my best. Please be patient. They all waited in silence. Then a faint greenish light began to glimmer out of the glowworm's tail, and this gradually became stronger and stronger until it was any way enough to see by. Some great journey, the centipede said, limping across the room. I shall never be the same again, murmured the earthworm. Nor I, the ladybird said. It's taken years of my life. But my dear friends, cried the old green grasshopper, trying to be cheerful. We are there. Where, they asked. Where? Where is there? I don't know, the old green grasshopper said, but I'll bet it's somewhere good. We are probably at the bottom of a coal mine, the earthworm said gloomily. We certainly went down and down and down, very suddenly at the last moment. I felt it in my stomach. I still feel it. Perhaps we are in the middle of a beautiful country full of songs and music, the old green grasshopper said. Or near the seashore, said James eagerly, with lots of other children down on the sand for me to play with. Pardon me, murmured the ladybird, turning a trifle pale, but am I wrong in thinking? that we seem to be bobbing up and down. Bobbing up and down, they cried. What on earth do you mean? You're still giddy from the journey, the old green grasshopper told her. You'll get over it in a minute. Is everybody ready to go upstairs now and take a look round? Yes, yes, they coerced. Come on, let's go. I refuse to show myself out of doors in my bare feet, the centipede said. I have to get my boots on again first. For heaven's sake, let's not go through all that nonsense again, the earthworm said. Let's all lend the centipede a hand and get it over with, the ladybird said. Come on. So they did, all except Miss Spider, who set about weaving a long rope ladder to reach from the floor up to a hole in 
the ceiling. The old green grasshopper had wisely said that they must not risk going out of the side entrance when they didn't know where they were, but must first of all go up on top of the beach and have a look round. So half an hour later, when the rope ladder had been finished and hung, and the 42nd boot had been laced neatly onto the centipede's 42nd foot, they were all ready to go out. Amidst mounting excitement and shouts of, Here we go, boys! The promised land! I can't wait to see it! The whole company climbed up the ladder, one by one, and disappeared into a dark, soggy tunnel in the ceiling that went steeply, almost vertically, upward. And from there, we shall end on chapter 18. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And I will see you on the next one. Peace and love, my friends.